Okay, thank you very much. I have a sort of deja vu because it's now four years ago that the kickoff meeting started in exactly this room. And I remember very well certain details like how people were sitting, and I also have some memories what I was talking about. I actually started here with a very general introduction into what psychologists think emotions are, which is not straightforward. As a matter of fact, next week Thursday, our semester starts next week, next uh, week Thursday I have my first course in emotion and motivation, and I will be spending in that semester about 30 hours discussing what psychologists think emotions are. And it's terrible because it's not enough time. It's not enough time. So looking at the program of this conference and having this time slot, I would like to just take you, put you in a time bubble that is sort of out of that so I would have more time, but I don't. So I made a decision to talk a little bit about what emotions are. Take a step back and talk basically very little about what we have been doing in the last four years. Instead, Dr. Küster will be talking at the poster session about that. I invite you all to go to the poster where he can tell you in more detail what we did over those four years. However, I think it is really important for the conference as a whole to reflect a little bit on what emotions are because it will affect a little bit how we think about what the various researchers here did, what the results that they found mean, and how we can go about pursuing this uh, any further. Now, emotion seems really a very simple term. As Professor Hollis said, we all know what emotions are. He showed some photos that we all could relate to. However, when you start talking with people, they use a variety of terms that seem to be somewhat synonymous, but they have just a certain overlap. It's not exactly the same. And those little things can be quite meaningful. You have seen in this very, very quick overview in the last half hour about what the various partners did in the Cyber Emotions Consortium that we looked at emotions. But what were we actually looking at? Where were we looking at emotions? What were we looking at? Sometimes we have these things talking about anger and excitement and sadness. And are we sometimes perhaps mixing different things? Actually, I think it's not that bad, but I do want to spend some time to reflect on it. To a large degree, modern views, modern scientific views of emotion are influenced by Charles Darwin. And via Sylvan Tompkins, probably a lot by Paul Ekman. This doesn't mean that all emotion researchers here in the room, and there are a couple uh, that I see, would see themselves as disciples of Ekman. But if you take a random psychology book, that's basically uh, what it is. And the story is very simple. There are a handful of emotions Sadness, happiness, surprise, anger, fear, and disgust, maybe contempt, and they are universal. These are emotions. And I tried to summarize some of the main assumptions of this notion, and this is that emotions are responses, so it, is, it happens to something. The events could be external or internal. They have a very brief duration, Ekman himself talks about a few seconds. And they are something inside of the person, and they are sort of externalized via expressions. And from his point of view, there are various conditions, social and cultural influences, that sort of distort these emotions, and particularly the expression, so that they are more difficult to detect. And there's only, as you saw in the picture before, a small number of basic emotions. Now, you cannot read this. This is from an overview paper by uh, James Gross and uh, Lisa Feldman Barrett, which was published in uh, 2011, where they tried to structure a little bit the ecology of emotion theories 
and you have a cluster of uh, very influential theorists who fall into this group that I just talked about, basic emotions. However, there are others who think of emotions as less clearly defined as something that uh, is a function of a rather complex set of evaluations uh, that can be partially culturally determined and moving more and more towards a construction side with on this side having social construction with the idea that emotions are just concepts that we define within a culture and that we can uh, agree on. Well, this, this looks a little bit chaotic and life was much easier when we just looked at the Ekman way of thinking about emotions. There we had simple rules and here it seems that people sort of differ a lot. Well, there was an important paper that haunted me throughout my uh, uh, career on emotions, if you will. Uh, this was published in 1981. This was just when I started to study by Klein Ginner and Klein Ginner and motivation and emotion. And what these researchers did is they said, well, you know, there are all of these different ways of thinking about emotion. And historically, they have been for a long time. Let's see what they actually do. And they took over 100 different statements, which they drew from various sources, and tried to see is there anything really different, what is common. And based on these definitions, they said, well, if we try to systemize uh, things a little bit, there are 11 types of categories of emotion theory concepts uh, that emphasize different aspects. Either that it has to do with a positive-negative distinction or that this is a physiological process, uh, that it disrupts ongoing behavior, that evolutionary it has particular functions, and it's very difficult to bring all of this together, and they ended up with a proposition what emotion is. This is the analysis based on all of these different theories. I will read this. As a working model, we propose the following definition. Emotion is a complex set of interactions among subjective and objective factors mediated by neural hormonal systems which can A, give rise to affective experiences such as feelings of arousal, pleasure, displeasure, B, generate cognitive processes such as emo emotionally relevant perceptual effects, appraisals, labeling processes, C, activate widespread physiological adjustments to the arousing conditions, and D, leads to behavior that is often, but not always, expressive, goal-directed, and adaptive. I will now switch this off and you have to repeat how much you remembered. Now this, this looks terrible. It's very complex, you know. This is not complex. This is a simplification, an oversimplification of highly complex ways how we can think of emotions. And still, we crave for the simple explanation. Emotions is a handful of facial expressions and they are very short and we can measure it and go ahead. Life ain't simple and emotions, which are an important part of our life, are not simple either. So, if you deal with this complexity, it is quite bad. We have to simplify things. And when you look at the research that we did over the last few years, we simplified things a lot. You have to simplify things in order to find certain systematic patterns, as Professor Hollist has shown. There were systematic patterns, and that suggests that what we did perhaps was not stupid. But we have to keep in mind where and how we simplified things and what the implications are. Personally, after being haunted by this paper in 1981, I, I just could not go on with this confusion, and I tried to see the positive in all of this. And I would read these papers, and I would say, you know, in reality, there's so much agreement. It is just that these bits and pieces were individual statements which were taken out of context and would emphasize this or that, but in reality, there is a core that people agree on. And so this big confusion is just a myth. However, it just goes on and on. A few years ago, 
in the uh, newsletter of the International Society for Research on Emotion. And we have members of the society here. You were, I don't know whether you even were president of the society when this uh, newsletter came out. The emotion issue, I, I love that. Uh, asked people to comment on this. And everybody did, I did too. I think Aaron, you did, I think you also had one of those in there. I think Bernard did not. Um, so maybe it is not a myth after all. And I must say my positive view was a little bit shocked after a paper which came out in 2010, which was published by Carol Izzard, because when I say, you know, uh, these definitions were taken out of context, what Izzard did was he went directly to the core. He went to the researchers and he sent them a questionnaire asking, what do you think? Is emotion this? Is emotion that? And this should reveal that the confusion is just a myth. Unfortunately, it discovered that the different researchers really disagree heavily on many of these things. This is terrible. So, uh, these were the, the questions, what is an emotion? What is the primary function of emotion? What activates an emotion? How is emotion most effectively regulated? And so forth. And the participants was the creme de la creme, distinguished scientists of those who agreed to participate, uh, 35 of the blah, 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 um, a member of the National Academy of Sciences, winners of the APA Award for Distinguished Scientific Contribution, past presidents of the APS, scientists, philosophers, holders of endowed chairs at leading universities. These are the people who write the books. And did they agree? No, they did not agree. Now, this would take too much time, but basically uh, there is a scale which is agreement from one to 10. One means not at all, 10 completely over these respondents. And for example, uh, there's a big agreement on things like neural systems dedicated at least in part to emotion processes. And then it goes downhill. And when it comes to how emotions are caused, the role of cognition and so forth, uh, here it is motivation, behavior characterized primarily as approach or withdrawal. People don't agree. They do not agree. So we should just stop emotion research, move on to happier fields where things are easy. Um, and yeah, well, that cannot be the answer. What Izzard says is taking together the observations of the scientists who contributed to this article, make it clear that emotion functions are broad and inclusive and its activators are numerous and pervasive. Emotion, as variously described by them, is integral to adaptive and maladaptive personal and social behavior, despite the current questionable status of the unqualified term emotion in the scientific literature. One path towards less semantic confusion in the literature is to stop using the noun emotion without contextualizing it and providing a statement of the meaning or meanings assumed by the author. And conveniently, this is where we come in. Cyber emotions, in a way, does not claim to describe the world. It tries to describe particular behaviors from the individual to e-communities in a very defined space. And that helps a lot. And I think this is a very, very important thing. The other aspect is, a very conscious reflection on how we define that thing, emotion, that we work on. And I think that helps. Uh, this is one of my recent papers, just to, to out of vanity, what I say these days. Um, emotions are foremost self-regulating processes that permit rapid responses and adaptations to situations of personal concern. They have biological basis and are shaped ontogenetically via learning and experience. Many situations and events of personal concern are social in nature. Thus, social exchanges play an important role in learning about rules and norms that shape regulation process, processes. Uh, blah, blah. Um, emotions are typically intra and interpersonal processes at the same time 
and modulating forces at these different levels interact. I keep <coughs> that particular part important because unlike this idea that emotions are something that happens to the individual, I think the notion that this social and cultural context distorts emotions has led some researchers to study emotion in isolation, to put a person into a quiet room, present a stimulus, and see how they respond. There are reasons to do that, but the problem is that in reality, emotions are highly interactive. And again, this is something that we look at in the Cyber Emotions Project. It is not that somebody in their own room thinks, you know, that tax increase I think is stupid and just sits there. But that person writes, you know, that tax increase is stupid. And then a person will say, who are you to call that stupid? I mean, these people understand blah, blah, blah. And a whole cascade starts because it is interactive. And there are certain properties of interactive emotions that are very difficult to grasp from that that we measure with people being alone in a dark room and being presented with an image. And because of that, it is crucial to move into the social sphere. And I'm very, very happy that the second talk in this cluster is given by Professor Rimé, who of course is uh, a leading researcher on social sharing of uh, emotions and looking at this in a very uh, uh, social context and the functions and effects of emotions in the social sphere. So one of the key ways how different people look at emotions is to look at basic emotions or discrete emotions, things like happiness, anger or sadness, and the things that you have seen in the short overview that Professor Hollis just showed. You rarely saw something about happiness, anger or sadness, but you did see a lot about positive and negative. So the idea to reduce the complexity of emotions to dimensions is quite old. As a matter of fact, in the 19th century, Wundt would have a, a very important theory looking at three dimensions and perhaps in the 20th century, there's a cascade of publications that can be tied to, to Schlossberg and some other researchers who said, we can simplify our understanding of emotions if we think of what are the underlying dimensions, things that they have in common and things that make them different. So for example, the idea would be, if I am afraid, then this is a very negative state that leads me to do certain things. But the same is true for anger. It is a negative state, or sadness. These are negative states, and because they are negative states, it means that there is something in my internal or external environment that requires modification. And perhaps if I think about it, that there is something negative, something that drives behavior, I can stop obsessing whether being annoyed and angry and uh, irritated, how close they are, because they are very close to each other in very conceptual ways of being negative states with a certain level of arousal and me possibly having a certain power to affect things. Um, most of the early work on dimensional approaches was looking at the proximity of emotion words or the evaluations of emotional expressions. And here is uh, one of these uh, uh, figures that tries to, based on uh, uh, subject ratings, order various emotional terms in a uh, uh, dimensional system where we have positive, negative, this is positive here, negative here, and this is low active and high active. This particular comes from an influential paper by Jim Russell in 1980. And you can see that among these terms are things like gloomy, bored, tired, 
which not necessarily are basic emotions, but which often have effective connotations. And you don't need to worry about that because you can just uh, plug them in. In a more recent paper, Yick, Russell, and Feldman Barrett looked at various dimensional models and argued that while they differ certain, in certain ways how they uh, call the, the dimensions that they look at and the arrangements of the, the axis that they put in there, that they can be put together in a sort of consensual uh, model. And this particular one uh, fits 20 unipolar affect constructs in a two-dimensional space. And this had a big influence on us because at the Cyber Emotions Consortium, we decided very early on that because of the complexity of, for example, measuring discrete emotions in short sentences, you know, that's kind of uncool. What, what, what emotion is that? That doesn't fit. However, we can see that it is a slightly negative thing, that we would go on the side of uh, dimensional approaches, and, and that has been very, very useful for us. Now, of course, the question is, um, how do you deal with certain things? So, for example, one of the uh, interesting developments in my mind is that in the last couple of decades, neuroscience has taken a stronger role in our understanding of psychological processes and also emotion. And one of them is that there are biological underpinnings for valence, but not in the sense that there is a valence system that is either positive or negative, but that there are systems that seem to have to do with negative affect, with avoidance, with moving away, and others with positive, approaching, pleasure, and so forth. And these are not the same. And so several researchers are arguing we should be considering positive and negative not as just the polar opposites of a single dimension, but we should consider the two of them uh, independent of each other. Maybe it is possible to be positive and negative at the same time. Now, as you heard already in the, the summary, Senti strength one of the key algorithms uh, that is used to, to dig into the data that we looked at does in fact provide both an output that, is, that estimates the positive and the negative balance of a sentence. Now, if you think of a sentence, a sentence already has a certain extension in time. So, that just would make sense, even if we were not sure that you could, at the very same moment, be positive or negative. I mean, you go to a movie, and the movie will have some happy moments and some sad moments, and of course. But as we go further, further down in time, can we have a very short moment that is both positive and negative? Well, for those of you who are old enough, if you have, for example, a child that goes off to college, it's a moment that is very positive and a moment that is very negative, both. And so it was very important for us, and I think some of the results that the consortium has found are linked to the fact that it is useful to consider positive and negative affect not mutually exclusive, but at the same time and see how they uh, relate to each other. So uh, I will not go uh, into this. Now Cassiopo and his colleagues, uh, particularly Gary Bernson and John Cassiopo have argued for uh, an effective space uh, that is bivariate, that takes positive and negative uh, into account, but I will, I will leave that. Of course, there are people who say, Two dimensions, that is just ridiculous. You cannot map the whole richness of affect into two dimensions, and of course I agree. Uh, the question is how many dimensions do you need? So this is a recent paper uh, from the group of Klaus Scherer uh, with Phoebe Ellsworth, and let me read the abstract. For more than half a century, emotion researchers have attempted to establish the dimensional space that most economically accounts for similarities and differences in emotional experience. 
Today, many researchers focus exclusively on two-dimensional models, including valence and arousal. Adopting a theoretically based approach, we show for three languages that four dimensions are needed to satisfactorily represent similarities and differences in the meaning of emotion words. In order of importance, these dimensions are evaluation, pleasantness, potency control, activation, arousal, and unpredictability. Now, um, Professor Hollis men mentioned already that there is a dominance of power a dimension as a third dimension, but as you will see, looking at our results, we did not always consider that. Much of our work was indeed based on two dimensions, and that also relates to the fact that we are dealing with getting a sense of what somebody feels, perhaps, from a very short statement. You know, this is kind of uncool. How much power is there? So, of course, that that is a, a problem. Now, I already said we're looking at a short text. Can we judge from a text what somebody feels or what they uh, what is going on inside of them? Well, let let's have a look at the uh, internet. What we have here is a figure that shows global page views per minute over the last 24 hours. And these are uh, news pages, global news pages. And you have here a time scale, 8 a.m., 12 p.m., 4 p.m., 8 p.m., and so forth. And you have here a quantity. And you can see that there seem to be some slow oscillations and some individual peaks. These peaks very typically relates to specific events. So for example, this peak here is linked to the death of Steve Jobs. So just by looking at how much people are using news sites, you can see there's something sticking out, something happened. And actually, just the activity on the internet is linked to particular events, peak events. So for example, the highest peaks on total page views per minute, the top of all time, from the time when I got this data was 24th of June 2010 at 12 p.m. And it was the simultaneous World Cup qualifying matches and the longest ever Wimbledon match. That created a lot of news traffic. The second Champions League European Cup games and so forth. Um, we have number 10 is an earthquake in Christchurch, New Zealand. No chance against the World Cup. You know, you have to have your priorities. This tells us just that there's something going on and likely it is something emotional. Now the problem is that we cannot use what people say or write or what they show on their faces, what they feel, what the bodily senses, that, uh, uh, the bodily reactions that we can measure actually explain the same. This has been argued many times in a very uh, uh, coherent way uh, and, and brief way in this nice paper on measures of emotion uh, a review by Iris Maus and Mike Robinson. And basically, they say these different measures don't correlate very well. Well, this is not surprising because it's easy to talk about expression versus uh, subjective experience. In reality, expression is not just expression. Expression is many, many things. So for example, voice, posture, facial expressions, blushing, gaze, the physiological effects, there are many things that we can look at. This is true for all of these concepts. But if I say expression in the voice, that actually means that there are certain bursts, jitter in the terms of how uh, regular the, the vocal folds vibrate. So each of these measures breaks down into hundreds of sub-measures. Different researchers use different measures. It's not surprising that all of these things don't correlate uh, uh, very highly. And as a matter of fact, one of my uh, favorite studies, uh, any category in psychology, is a study by uh, Jose Miguel Fernandez Doltz. I will, I will try <coughs> to summarize it. I'll, I'll, Simplify it terribly. Imagine 
You are a subject in a psychological experiment. You come to the laboratory. The researcher says, OK, what we're going to do is you're going to watch some videos, and we are going to ask you some questions afterwards. And there are some TVs and VCRs. And while this interaction goes on, another experimenter comes in and says to the first experimenter, I'm sorry, there's a phone call. And so the experimenter says, I told you not to disturb me while I'm doing research. No, it's important. The experimenter says, OK, I'm sorry. I will take quickly care of this. You wait. I will be back. So you wait, sitting there waiting. And those of you who remember VCRs, they're getting less frequent. When you keep them in pause for a while, they start to jump out of pause and play. And this is what happens. So the VCR just starts to play. And what do you see? You see black beauty. You see a black horse jumping around. And it's sort of nice and so forth. That's done. And then the next one starts. And you see a, a man with a big smile on his face. You see an ax. And you see certain events that boiled down, which involve lots of blood. And uh, for those of you who know the movie The Shining know what I'm talking about, it's over. The experimenter comes back in and says, oh, it started. Well, that shouldn't have happened. But as it has started, I I'll give you the questionnaire. We cannot show this again to you. Please answer the questions, and then we'll proceed. OK. Now, this is a very elaborate piece of theater that is supposed to convince the subject that what happens at that moment is not part of an experiment. They are not being measured. This is just a spontaneous event that happens to happen in a laboratory. Well, of course, they were hidden cameras. They were measuring what they showed on their face. And so what they said is, well, if the theories are right, if somebody says, he was afraid, then I would expect a certain expression on their face based on Darwin, Ekman, and so forth. If they were disgusted, then I would expect a certain expression on their face and whatnot. And so they looked at it. And if I remember the data correctly, only in two of 30 cases was there coherence between what people showed and what they said they felt. Under these conditions, which ethically, are, are, we can argue about that, it's, it's very difficult uh, ethically. So what that means is, if you construct a situation that seems to be somewhat spontaneous, these different things don't correlate very highly. And so the conclusion of this review on these uh, measures of emotion simply says, um, Across response systems, the bulk of the available evidence favors the idea that measures of emotional responding reflect dimensions rather than discrete states. Now, we do not know a dimensional analysis of the experiment with the shining and all of that. But very likely, they would have said that this was not pleasant, seeing that ax and the blood whether they called it disgust or whether they called it fear, what exact moment they were referring to, it would have been negative. And I'm sure that the expression would have been negative. So there are reasons why moving from discrete emotions to uh, dimensions will be a smart move to create more coherence uh, in the data. These days, there are many issues that, that researchers discuss. And I will not go into uh, all of these. But one of the key things for me, and that was already evident in that brief uh, definition from my own paper, is how do these different levels at which we study emotions relate to each other? This is a figure which is from Cassiopo and Tessonary, um, which these days very much uh, characterizes the approach in social neuroscience, trying to understand psychological processes by looking at very, very different levels, starting basically from molecular level to uh, uh, social behaviors. And I think this is one of the big challenges. And in the context of uh, uh, 
cyber emotions, it means how do individual emotions relate to the complex social interactions in the internet? Cyber emotions. Well, are cyber emotions different emotions than non-cyber emotions? This is a question we asked four years ago in this room. My answer is yes and no. In the sense that individuals who are experiencing emotions are the consequence of a very, very long evolution. They are consequences of early experiences when they are babies, children, and so forth. And it is not that being on the internet suddenly creates different emotions. However, if you think of cyber emotions as something that is at a different level of organization, and you think of cyber emotions as something that is a property of many people, then of course they are different. Cyber emotions are different than the emotions in a football stadium, which we often use as an example, because of the properties of uh, cyberspace. We have tried in my own lab to look at that also in the laboratory, meaning having people engage with the internet while taking physiological measures, while asking them questions, and really going at a microscopic level into things. And we find that the responses that we find resemble responses to, for example, visual material that has been used in other contexts, and uh, Dennis Küster will be happy to, to explain more to you uh, later this afternoon. Basically, we have been looking at psychophysiological responses, <coughs> expressive behavior, self-report in the sense that we ask people various questions and what they actually write. This is what the poster looks like. You'll find it easily. So, are there cyber emotions? When we tried to create a Wikipedia entry, we discovered the ugly reality of Wikipedia. We were shut down so fast you could hardly hit the return key. And people said, oh, this is, this is rubbish, and who are you, and whatnot. We ended up having a Wikipedia page where we talk about cyber emotions primarily as cyber emotions, not the thing, but cyber emotions, the project. So this is cyber emotions. Uh, it's a large scale integration project funded by the European Union and so forth. And that is fine, that is fine. So I have here a very first definition for discussion purposes, which we have not discussed. What I think after those four years how I would define cyber emotions. Cyber emotions refers to effective processes in <coughs> social networks involving mediated communications that are influenced by emotional states of individuals and that in turn may lead to the elicitation or modulation of emotional states of individuals in networks and in consequence to state changes in e-communities as a whole. So the idea would be that cyber emotions are not a property of individuals, but they are a property of networks. It does not suppose that the whole network is in one state. It is not collective in the sense that there's a synchronization of these states, but simply that these are mutually dependent effective states. So, cyber emotions do not imply homogeneous distributions of a specific effective state in networks, the network characteristics affect the dynamic properties of the cyber emotions and they are often linked to external events and also involve offline communications. This is very important because no man is an island and no e-community exists only in cyberspace but instead people have many different ways and recent studies on how people interact in the case of catastrophes or particular events underline that people use various traditional mass media 
direct, also offline communication between people. They sit in the bus, they talk about these events, and then they go online. Thank you. Yes, we have two minutes while Bernard switches computers. Yeah. You were saying uh, it was about cyber emotions in the context of uh, emergence. Yes. And, and it's a rather early, yes. in a rather early form. How do you relate that then to what people used to do 100 years ago yes. when they would write letters? Yes. And people were very articulate in letters and could express yes. emotions in those days. There are many examples yes. you can find. Uh, so what happened when we went to this internet stuff where people only write very short things which could no doubt create confusion often rather than any emotional... Uh, yeah. Well, one, let, let me reply first with a domain that I know absolutely nothing of, namely the stock market. People used to trade for a long time. And these would be traders in rooms, and they would get notices and messages. As we go towards high-speed systems, that sometimes have only fractions of a second in response, there are certain things that happen because you suddenly see, for example, an increase in a behavior that triggers an immediate response that would not have been as obvious if you take things at a much slower time frame. That, I think, is one of the crucial things. People will have communicated via letters for example, about a political thing. So, I don't know, I haven't seen that movie Lincoln. It's currently in the, the theaters. I'm sure that there were many, many interactions on the role of slavery, the role of slavery for economy and whatnot, where people would be writing forth and back. And if the same thing would have happened in a forum, they would have yelled within seconds. There is something about the immediacy, I think, that's not all of it. But there is something to the immediacy, how quick it is and easy it is to respond, that sort of triggers emotional responses that maybe, if you had more time, would be regulated, would be thought about, you would consider various things. And maybe that is one of the key differences. It's only one. There, there are probably more, but there's no doubt that people complain that there is so much negative effect in these exchanges, which was one of the reasons for the whole project, one of which goals was to reduce negative emotions and, and the negative consequences on, on e-communities. I'm still uh, troubled by the uh, claim that uh, cyber emotions are not property of individuals. Ah. Uh, in, I mean, uh, uh, also in, uh, let's say, offline circumstances, you have emotions in, uh, in a social setting. Yes. And, uh, uh, but the emotions are still of the individual. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. So what is the difference here and why we cannot say, OK, if you participate in some cyber activity, you have the emotion of the individual, but there is sharing like in the offline circumstances. Yes. Because of this idea that one should study these things at different levels of resolution, of course there are individual emotions in cyber emotions. But if I was to create a journal called Cyber Emotions and I would have to accept which papers would I publish or which I would not, then I would focus on things that relate to the interaction of people in the internet rather than, let's say, some, somebody saying, you know, sometimes I get sad when I read stuff on the internet. So that not just the fact that the internet is involved, and this is a purely constructive definition. I'm trying to come up with a definition that is not 
Cyber emotions is any type of emotional process that is somehow connected to the internet. That wouldn't help us. That's all. We'll, we'll, talk, we'll talk more about that. Thank you very much.